mercy and peace are yours in rich measure from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let's begin with a prayer. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the name of him who sent his son to serve and to save, to seek the lost, And to call his servants into the world to do the same, to go and to seek and to save through that saving power of God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, dear Jarrett, who am I? It was an understandable response to the divine call that God had just given to Moses as he stood there in front of a a fiery bush. Just moments before, Moses had been tending the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro, and now suddenly he found himself in front of a burning bush, being called to, to go and to do something that seemed beyond him, he found himself in an encounter with God Almighty. Who am I that I should go and and lead God's people? It was a good question and one to which Moses felt that he already knew the answer because the path to that burning bush was not exactly an honorable one, was it? You recall the story. How many years before, Moses, in a fit of rage, had murdered a man with his own hands. And then in a panic, he, he thought to, to bury the body in the sand to, to cover his tracks and to cover what he had done, only, only the truth would not stay buried for long. And once Moses discovered that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had found out what he had done and wanted him dead, Moses fled his blood-stained path for the wilderness of Midian. And there he found a woman named Zipporah, and he married her, and he began a, a new life. I wonder if he ever told his wife, Zipporah about his wicked past? Did he ever share with his new family, did he share with them that he had blood on his hands, that he was a murderer and a fugitive from the the swift justice of the king of Egypt? The Bible never tells us. But here, in this moment before that fiery, flaming presence of the I am God, there were no secrets. God knew every bit of Moses' wickedness, all of his guilt, all of his dishonor. God knew his past. And there was nothing that could be hidden about Moses' past, about his guilt from the God who knows all, who sees all. And so Moses recounts for us what his reaction was in that moment. He tells us that he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. He knew that as one who was guilty of murder, he had no business standing in the presence of a holy God and certainly no business standing as his representative to his chosen people. You know, sometimes we have to talk about the unfortunate thing about when, when ministers disqualify themselves for ministry. I don't know, maybe murder would be one of those things. Or so Moses thought. Here's where the story about Moses takes a surprising turn. 
Because instead of that fiery, flaming presence of God's holiness reaching out and consuming the sinner before him, God in grace called out to him, Moses. Moses. God went on to tell him about his desire to deliver his people Israel from their suffering in Egypt. He had heard their cries. He had seen their pain. He had understood their suffering in the land of Egypt under the hand of Pharaoh. And he would no longer stand by and allow that suffering to continue. More surprising still is what God said next. Because God certainly didn't need Moses in any way. God certainly had the power and the presence to defeat the king of Egypt, the superpower that it was, without Moses' help. But God in grace turned to his runaway fugitive, Moses, and he said, I am sending you to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Yet isn't that precisely how our gracious and holy God so often works? In this sermon series on the holy ministry, we see clearly that the ministry is filled with sinful people who have been called by God. We saw it in our other readings for today. The Apostle Paul, self-proclaimed chief of sinners, right? A blasphemer and a persecutor, a man who had made it his life's mission to stamp out the followers of Jesus Christ. And yet God called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. In our gospel lesson for today, We saw Jesus calling Matthew a tax collector, a cheat, a man who was apparently willing to sell out his own people for a slice of the good life for himself. And yet God chose him as well to be an apostle. And not only an apostle, but also an evangelist, a writer of his holy inspired word. And there are others too, right? You can think back your knowledge of Old Testament history, you can think back to to men like Abraham, a man who lied multiple times about his wife. You might think about somebody like David, right? A man who was an adulterer and himself a murderer. Or Jonah, the one whom God called to, 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 to go. He sent Jonah to the people of Nineveh, but instead he got on the first boat going in the opposite direction. Or in the New Testament, there are people like Peter, one who publicly, repeatedly denied even knowing Jesus. Or James and John, the brothers who couldn't stop arguing amongst them about who was greatest in the kingdom of God. And that list could go on. We see again that God calls sinners into the public ministry. When you look at the personal lives of God's chosen leaders, they certainly don't stand out as ideal candidates, do they? None were all that special all by themselves. So why would God choose them? Why would God do this method? Why would he appoint such men as these to lead his people? To use us? You know the answer. It's grace. It's undeserved love. God is gracious and in his grace, God is always working according to a bigger plan, a plan bigger than any single leader. This account from Exodus chapter 3, it's not really about Moses. It's about the grace of our God. And it's about the grace of our God and his plan to to rescue God's people out of Egypt so that they could be his people and serve as his people 
in spite of his objections, in spite of his imperfections and his sin, God chose to use Moses to deliver his people because, again, God had an even grander plan than just the delivery of his people out of Egypt. And that was a plan that centered in a greater prophet who was coming to carry out an even greater ministry. The work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And so it's how the Lord works. As the Apostle Paul later wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1, he said, God chose the foolish to shame the wise. He chose the weak to shame the strong. He chose those that are not to nullify those that are so that no one may boast before the Lord. God chooses unlikely people to serve him so that his grace and so that his power might be shown all the more clearly through them. God takes people, broken people, sinful people, people struggling under sin and human weakness, and he uses them to accomplish his divine purposes. And so that's why God said to Moses, I will be with you. And this will be the sign that you, the the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And so the accomplishments of Moses, the accomplishments of the prophets and the apostles, all of it clearly demonstrates God's grace and God's strength. He used unlikely men to do his will. He chose unholy men to speak and proclaim and teach his holy word. He chose weak men and women to accomplish his powerful acts. On his own, what chance would Moses have stood against a man like Pharaoh? None. But along with Moses, along with a man who was a murderer and a fugitive, God's divine power went. And that power brought the great nation of Egypt to its knees. So what does that all have to do with you and me? What about all of us gathered here together today? What about you, Jared? What do the stories of Moses and Matthew and Paul have to do with those of us who are gathered together on a day such as today? Is it possible, is it possible that their story is also our story? If the story of our life were written down on the pages of our Bibles, what would it say? What secrets have you tried to bury deep that you don't want anyone to know about? Those shameful acts that that you have kept hidden from the world. What would the people sitting in the pew next to you or in front of you or behind you, what would those people think of you if they knew your most secret sin? Jarrett, in some ways it may feel like you are sitting in front of a burning bush today as you're beginning your ministry. There's no burning bush here. But we are standing or sitting in the presence of our holy God. And he is the God who knows all and who sees all. This is the God who has reminded us that wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is with us. So know for certain that even now you are in the presence of God at this very moment. The God who knows our life story, who has seen the sins that we have buried deep in our lives, sins that are not hidden from his all-seeing eyes. So knowing that, how would we expect God to act? Humanly speaking, what would you expect a holy God to say? What would you expect to hear from him who is the judge of the world, who is an all-consuming fire? 
would that God choose you? Would he choose me? Would he choose you to, to be his follower? Would he call you to serve in the ministry of his kingdom? How could he possibly do that, humanly speaking? How could he possibly want to have anything to do with you or me or any of us? If this were a job interview, God would be wise to give us the old cliche brush off, right? Don't call us, we'll call you. As the undeserving, underqualified, or even disqualified servants that we are. But Jarrett, Pastor Schreiner, members of Victory Lutheran, this is where your story lines up with Moses' story. As God dealt with Moses, even in great patience, to come up, I don't know if you're accounting, with no less than five different times in that account where Moses was trying to offer excuses to God, reasons why he was not the right one for the job. Yet God graciously called Moses a murderer, a fugitive, to be his chosen servant. Not because he was qualified, but because God is a gracious God. Because God is always working according to a bigger plan, a greater agenda, an agenda of mercy and grace, both for those who serve and those to whom he sends them to serve. Jarrett. Son, what a joy and a privilege it is for me to be able to get to be here today, to be the one who gets to share the word of God with you and with your new family of believers through whom the Lord has called you into service and to whom he has called you to serve. Talk about grace. Talk about undeserved so too with you the grace of God, that undeserved love as the, the hymn writer wrote it so eloquently, that love that was born and burned its way into your heart unasked, unforced, unearned. Remember that grace. Remember that the ministry is filled by God with people that he's called. Sinful people people that will reflect his power and his grace. Remember this privilege that you are receiving, that it's not about you alone, but about a bigger plan of God, a plan of mercy and grace, a plan of God that is for victory and that is for Jacksonville, that is for who knows how far the Lord will take the work that you together are doing as the ministers that he sends. That is a plan that centers and always centers on Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. A plan to call still others into the faith and from those to call still others into a holy ministry. And when you're tempted, on the one hand, to forget the grace of God and the almighty power behind God that will be at work within you, and thus to begin to fear and to doubt and to worry, or like Moses, to begin to, to offer excuses to God why maybe you're not the right man for the job, or why you can't do this particular ministry task or that, or the ditch on the other side, when you might be tempted in those moments in arrogance and pride to think that you know best how things should go, or when you're tempted by the theology of glory to want to do the thing that'll make a name for yourself, or the popular thing, or the logical thing, even if it's a little bit sinful thing. When you're tempted to, to drive into either the ditch of despair or the ditch of pride and arrogance, remember these words. Remember the grace of God that calls sinful human beings into ministry. 
Remember how powerfully God worked in spite of Moses, in spite of Jonah or Matthew or Paul. Remember how powerfully God worked through them to accomplish great things. But all things that again were part of a bigger plan, a plan of of mercy and grace that centered in Jesus. A plan that culminated in the greatest prophet who carried out the greatest ministry, a perfect life in your place and mine, whose blood washes us clean, who makes us worthy in his sight. Yes, God chooses the most unlikely of candidates to serve him. Sinful people, sinful people like Moses, like Matthew, like Paul, like Marty, like Anne, like Troy, like Jarrett. God uses sinful people so that his mercy and so that his grace so that his power can be on display he chooses us he adopts us all as his own dear children he he washes us in the blood of the lamb he washes us in the waters of holy baptism he puts his name on us because he's got a divine plan a bigger plan than any one of us And as he did for them, as he does for us, so he will do for you. To work in you and through you. So trust that grace. Rely on his power. And trust in the promise that he said to Moses. So he promises to you, Jarrett, to you, Victory. I will be with you. I will be with you. Amen.